Welcome to Root and Revelation. Uh, I'm your host, Nate, and with me is Nick, the other host. How's it going, guys? And uh, we're here as Root and Revelation, obviously, and we're trying to make God's revelation our foundation of every area and in, in, in all of life. So with us, we have our second time guest, Tony Costa. How are you doing, Tony? I'm doing great. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, thanks for joining us once again. Uh, for newer listeners, potentially, um, uh, would you maybe share a little quick bio of yourself, Tony, to possibly people that didn't hear your first episode? Sure. Uh, I'm, an, uh, I'm a Christian apologist from uh, Toronto, Canada, and uh, I teach with the Toronto Baptist Seminary, and uh, I also teach with the University of Toronto uh, in areas of uh, biblical uh, archaeology and gospel studies. And um, I also teach with the Providence Theological Institute in Franklin, Tennessee, uh, as, a, as um, an adjunct professor. Uh, I'm also a pastor. Uh, I do ministerial work here in Canada as well. And I'm married uh, to a lovely lady, a wonderful wife by the name of Vita. I'm also a father of three children who are now all grown up adults. And I'm also a grandfather uh, to, to one grandson. Um, so, uh, it's my life's ambition to, uh, give reasons for the Christian faith and to help equip God's people, uh, to give them tools to, uh, always be ready, uh, to give an answer to those who ask about the hope that we have in Christ. Hey, Tony. Um, so I wasn't here last time you were on the podcast. I did listen to the episode. It was very good. So thank you again for that. I'm just curious, because I know we're going to be talking about uh, Roman Catholicism here in a minute, but uh, you mentioned that you're an apologist, and I, I'm just curious, what, uh, what was your introduction into apologetics, and, and what did you like about it? How, how did you get into this space, I guess? Right. That's a good question. Well, I was raised Roman Catholic. Uh, I came from a Roman Catholic background. My parents uh, were uh, from Portugal. They migrated to Canada in 1966, were married in Canada, and I was raised Roman Catholic, was uh, taught in the Roman Catholic Catechism, and it wasn't until I was about the age 15 that I first heard the gospel uh, of grace um, by two of my cousins who had come to faith in Christ, also former Roman Catholics, and I um, and so at the young age of 15, I actually went out to try to prove them wrong and to prove to them that the Roman Catholic Church was the true church that Jesus Christ established uh, through Peter as the first pope. And what ended up happening was I, I went to the Bible, which I had never read, uh, read it for the first time, went through Genesis, literally through uh, all of Genesis to Revelation, and the scriptures ended up convicting me. Christ uh, spoke to me through his word and heavily convicted me, and I gave my life to the Lord Jesus. I was born again. About a year or so after that, I uh, almost fell into a, a cult. Uh, at that time, it was known as the Worldwide Church of God, uh, headed by Herbert W. Armstrong. Uh, the Worldwide Church of God, incidentally, has gone, has gone evangelical. They now have changed their name. They're no longer known as the Worldwide Church of God. But, but at that time, they were heretical. Uh, they, they denied the Trinity, denied the deity of Christ, believed in salvation by works. And, um, and they were a mixture of Mormonism, Seventh-day Adventism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and, and what's known as Anglo-Israelism or British Israelism that basically teaches that America and Britain are really the 10 lost tribes of Israel. Um, so I came very close to, to falling into this cult. I began reading their literature. And it was at that time that the Lord really um, shook me up. He basically slapped me upside the head, as they say in the South, and woke me up to the reality that there are a lot of wolves out there that disguise themselves as, as Christians. And so that was the breaking point for me. That's when I realized at that point, I think it was 17 or 18, that uh, I knew uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the Lord had called me to the field of apologetics. I was planning to be a veterinarian because I love animals, uh, but the Lord had different uh, had a different road for me, a different path. And so, I went into higher education. I, I went into the uh, to the University of Toronto. I did my bachelor's and master's there, uh, and then went to Europe to Holland uh, to do my PhD at Radboud University. 
And so I realized that to be an apologist, and this is not necessarily for all apologists, but in particular, I realized that the only place that you're going to be able to reach the, the young academic minds that are being diluted by the various philosophical worldviews today, whether it's uh, nihilism or postmodernism or atheism, agnosticism, I realized that I had to get into the academic arena. And so I went and did my postgraduate studies so that I could reach uh, these young people in college and university. Um, and, and so uh, this is the area God has called me to. I've been involved in, in this field now for 30 years. And I thank the Lord for providing so much fruit, uh, seeing Muslims come to faith in Christ, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons coming to faith in Christ, Hindus, Sikhs, uh, Jewish people finding the Jewish Messiah and, and coming to faith in him. Uh, and so that was what God had in his, in his purpose for my life uh, before I even knew it. But uh, I just thank him for, for his, his grace and, and, and calling me to this field. That's a real blessing. Thank you. Uh, thanks for explaining that. Uh, before we kick it off, I, uh, I didn't discuss this with Nate, but do you want to hear a quick story about my only experience in a Roman Catholic church? Sure, I would love to. So uh, I had a very close friend at the time, and uh, I was going to her confirmation. I think it's confirmation. Uh, Catholics go through that process. They were, they were a um, very, they didn't go to church ever, but they got confirmed anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think I was a junior in high school, and I'm uh, in this Catholic church I've never been in before. My only experience is really in the United Methodist Church mm -hmm. and very nominally at that. And so there were a lot of flutes. There were a lot of weird instruments and the service was very long and it was exhausting. And um, I, I just couldn't wait for it to be over. And uh, then they were going to go take communion. And I was the first person in the first row, Tony. And so I looked to uh, my friend's dad and I'm like, hey, what should I do? He's like, I'll oh, just go up. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and so I go up and uh, I walk up to the priest and he holds up what I didn't now know is called the Eucharist. Yeah. So he's holding it up there and I look at him and I, I, I reach up and I grab it out of his hand. I snatch it from him <laughs> and I go to the next guy who's holding this cup and he's not like moving the cup and he was, it was kind of weird. So I just like picked up the Eucharist and I dipped it in the cup. Okay. And then I tossed it in my mouth and I ate it. And um, then I went and sat down and I watched everybody else have them place it on their tongue and drink from the cup. And that's right. And everybody knew that I wasn't Catholic, Tony. Right, right, right. And, and uh, officially speaking, uh, non-Roman Catholics are not allowed to take communion. Uh, the reason for that is uh, to take communion in the Roman Catholic Church you must believe in transubstantiation. We can talk a little bit about that today. That's the belief that after consecration, the bread and the wine become literally the body and blood of Christ under the, the appearance of bread and wine. And so what non-Roman Catholics are supposed to do when they go up is they cross their hands, their arms across their chest, and that indicates to the priest that you're not a Roman Catholic and that you just want a blessing. And so the priest will just bless you, but he will not give you communion. Uh, and, and so that's the official stance of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and they take that quite seriously. But right now, let's just say the Roman Catholic Church is in a bit of a shambles right now with Pope uh, Francis. We can talk a little bit about that as well. But the fact that there's a debate over whether or not Biden can take communion or not because he's, he's pro-choice, he promotes abortion, there's a, huge con there's a huge contradiction here because if you're going to give communion to somebody who commits what's called a mortal sin, that is killing human life, but then not give communion to a Protestant who believes in, in the value of, of life. It's a bit of a contradiction there, an inconsistency, I would say. But uh, that's, why, that's why in the Roman Catholic Church, I mean, the priest didn't know that. He didn't know that you weren't Roman Catholic, but he probably figured it when you grabbed the the, the host uh, or the Eucharist from his hand. Usually Roman Catholics could either take it directly, they'll take it in, 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 they'll just, the priest will place it on their tongue or they'll do this, they'll cup their hands and the priest puts it in their hand and then they dip it in the wine 
But even, even taking the wine is unusual because most Roman Catholic masses, you only take the bread and uh, the wine is only reserved for weddings and special occasions. So we actually have, um, I just remember this, Nate, we have a friend, uh, Vincent, the fake Greg Bonson, and uh, he had a inquiry and I didn't really know how to respond. I don't know if Nate did, but he was saying that if they believe in transubstantiation and they believe that the Eucharist is the body of Christ, would, would it therefore also be all the body of Christ, like the bones of Christ? And then if you ate the Eucharist, wouldn't you then be breaking the bones of Christ, which would contradict prophecy, I believe? Well, when you think about it, the official Roman Catholic doctrine is that at, trans, at transubstantiation, the, the Eucharist becomes uh, the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of Christ. So that what you have is the God-man is present in the bread and the wine, really pre present. They'll call this the real presence. But you make a good point. Uh, you know, one of the things my mother used to go crazy about was she used to always tell me when you go to take communion, uh, you don't chew on the host, like don't chew on the bread. Uh, because, you know, the whole idea is just let it melt and, and swallow. You, you know, you're not supposed to bite because, you know, that's Jesus. But I said, but mom, but Jesus said, take and eat. He didn't say take and, you know, it's not like M&Ms, you know, uh, you know, melts in your mouth and on your hands. And, and then I asked my mom, I said, but look, if I'm taking that bread and it enters my mouth and it goes into my stomach, well, where does Jesus go now? you see where this is going. In other words, if Jesus Christ is, is literally present in that host, uh, and, and, and whatever, what does Jesus say? What enters the mouth goes to the stomach and then is, is expelled from the body. Uh, and my mom said, oh, don't even think that. That's blasphemy. But I said, but that is a, that is a, a, a good question. Um, and, and then let's say when someone vandalizes the Roman Catholic Church and they, and they steal the, the, the consecrated uh, hosts that are in the Blessed Sacrament, in that box where they keep the extra pieces of the bread, uh, have they abducted Jesus? Have they taken him hostage? Uh, and so the, literal, the littleness of this whole thing, as you can see, raises up a lot of questions that most Roman Catholics would say, well, if someone robs this church and steals the consecrated hosts, the presence of Christ simply disappears from it. I mean, it, we really get into almost metaphysical type of thinking. And it just, uh, to me, I think transubstantiation is really a result of, it's really, if you really want to get to the nitty gritty here, it, it's Aristotelian, uh, Aristotelian thinking, the whole idea of substance and accidents. Uh, and, and that is why it had to be formulated over the centuries and had to be declared a dogma, or at least declared a teaching of the church uh, at the council of, of um, at the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 AD. So as you can see, this isn't something that sprang up out of the New Testament. This is something that was debated through the centuries until the Roman Catholic Church officially declared this to be, this is the teaching of the church. That's really helpful. Thank you. All right. I, you know, uh, man, I've learned more about Roman Catholicism in this short 10 minutes than I've ever <laughs> known in the past. So. Oh, well, thank you. Well, we are just getting started. So yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that was great. That, I mean, that's really helpful. Even this right away, get off with a uh, transubstantiation. I can never really say it that right, but um, yeah. So Tony, I mean, maybe you can kind of, so for a listener, I'm sure everyone has caricatures of Roman Catholics, or maybe they have accurate representations of that. Maybe you could do like a little um, uh, biographical kind of this understanding of, of what is Roman Catholicism. Right. And then obviously a lot of our listeners are Protestants sure. so, and then kind of incorporating what the contrasting sure. them. Well, one of the things I think we need to really uh, recapture is we've, we've, we've given up that term Catholic and, and that is terrible because it's such a beautiful word. It's such a powerful word. And the word Catholic means universal. It means global. It means that the church is, is it's transcultural. It, it's not just made up of one particular group of people. And so you'll notice a lot of our Protestant friends will always say the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church. But the fact of the matter is the, the, church, the church of Jesus Christ is Catholic. I mean, that's why the Nicene Creed says, I believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. 
The church is one, she is holy, she's apostolic, but she's also Catholic. She is around the world. She's not just in one part of the world. So I always advise, when I teach on this subject, I always tell my students, uh, always um, qualify it by saying Roman Catholic, because the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church will say they're the Catholic Church. They will use that language as well. And so let's not give up this, this precious term, because this is a term that literally means, it's a Greek word that literally means whole, uh, entire, uh, global. So let's define it as the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, let's see about its history. So we know for a fact that the church was found, there was a church that there was a, a church that was planted in the city of Rome. We know that because we have a letter in the New Testament that is addressed to the Romans. Paul wrote to the church in Rome. Paul did not found that church. He was not the founder of that church. And incidentally, neither was Peter. Now, how do we know that? Well, because we know somebody laid that church because Paul says that he does not lay a foundation on a foundation that's already been laid. And that is, someone's already brought the gospel to Rome. Paul wanted to go visit these brethren in Rome. He eventually did, according to Acts 28. Um, but we know Peter was not the founder of the church in Rome, because if he was, Paul would have openly called out Peter on this. I mean, he would say, hey, Peter's the guy who started the church in Rome, because Peter is mentioned in Paul's letters. In 1 Corinthians, Galatians, he makes mention of Peter. He knew him personally. So the Roman church will always tell you the church of Rome was founded by Peter. That's not what the New Testament says. Now, later tradition may say that, but the question is, um, what do we find more reliable? Is it the first century documents themselves? Uh, or do we go with some later church tradition? We gotta be careful because tradition has, has shown to be a little, let's just say some elements of tradition are legendary. Okay, so, so Irenaeus, second century church father, 150 AD, says that Jesus was 50 years old when he died. And he says he got that from the apostles. I don't know any Roman Catholic theologian or Protestant or Orthodox that believes Jesus was 50 years old when he died. I mean, everyone uh, follows the, 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 the idea that he had a three-year ministry. He died at 33, the age 33. Um, so we, what we find then is there was a church in the city of Rome. We know that Paul did visit Rome. Uh, according to Acts, he went to Rome. We know that he, according to church tradition, he was executed in Rome which would make sense because he had appealed to Caesar to be tried in Rome. And so it seems very reasonable to believe that Paul met his end in Rome. And there's also a tradition that Peter also went to Rome and he died by being crucified upside down. There doesn't seem to be anything unusual about that. Now, the question is this, um, for the first three, 400 years of church history, the belief was that there were Basically, uh, uh, there was what's called the Pentarchy. The Pentarchy is the five ruling bishops of the church. So what that meant was there were five major cities in the first three centuries of the church, four centuries. You've got Jerusalem, you've got Antioch, you've got Alexandria, you've got Constantinople, and you've got Rome. Each of these cities were headed by what's called a bishop, an overseer. Now, the bishopric begins to develop around the second century, and there's reasons for that. A lot of it had to do with fighting Gnosticism. Gnostics claimed they had bishops that were, were traceable back to the apostles, and so the church began to install bishops over cities and so forth. That's the origin of the bishop, and, and you see this apostolic succession today in the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox, even the, the Anglican Church, Church of England. Um, and so what you find is there's these five pentarchs, five leaders of the church, and they were all equal. They all regarded each other as equals. They didn't consider one better than the other or one higher than the other. But what happens is the, the Bishop of Rome, particularly with Leo, and they were all called popes, by the way. So the word pope was designated to the, the, the bishop of the, of the city. He was considered a pope, um, which simply means papa, father. So by the year, by the time you get to around the late 400s or so, uh, Pope Leo uh, the first begins to claim supremacy over all the church. He says, I sit in, Cedar, in Peter's chair, 
And therefore, he says, I am the prince of the church. I am the leader of the church. And all the other bishops were to submit to him. Well, guess what the other bishops said? Well, who do you think you are? We're all equals. We're all equals. We're not, one is not higher than the other. Well, the Bishop of Rome began to apply all those texts, you know, you are Peter, and on you I'll build my church, I give you the keys to the kingdom of God, and so forth. He began to claim to be the direct successor of Peter. Before that, uh, the bishops understood uh, Cyprian, for example, Cyprian uh, of Rome, St. Cyprian, as he's known in the Roman Catholic Church. He made it very clear that uh, wherever the bishops are, there the seat of Peter is. In other words, all the bishops sit on the seat of Peter equally. So it's with the rise of Leo and then his claim to supremacy that you begin to see this, this claim to this idea that the Bishop of Rome had more power over the other bishops. And then what this did was, over the centuries, this, this caused a huge conflict with the Eastern Church, because the Eastern Church basically said, where are you, get, where are you coming with this? So um, eventually what ends up happening is the Bishop of Rome asserts himself as the leader of the physical church, the visible church. So the papacy is, a, is already being developed. And then by the year 1054, there's a major split. It's called the Great Schism between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. So a delegate is sent from Rome to Constantinople. He walks into uh, Hagia Sophia, that beautiful structure that is, is now a mosque today in, in Istanbul. Uh, he walks in there, disrupts the service, and basically places a papal bull on the altar of the church and basically says, if you do not accept the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome, uh, the, the Pope will uh, excommunicate you. This is the anathema of, of the Pope. Well, they basically tell him, you know, to, you know, go fly a kite. And they tell him, well, we're, we're going to return the favor and we're going to excommunicate the Bishop of Rome as an apostate. And so since 1054, there has never been any uh, reconciliation between the Roman Church and the Eastern Church, or the Orthodox Church as we know today. And so what you're finding is by the time you get to the, the, the turn of the millennium, the, the year 1000 of, of AD, that's when the papacy has now reached that point that we know it today, that the idea that the papacy is, uh, uh, the Pope is Christ's representative on the earth. And, and uh, remember, it was during that time that the, the Crusades were called by the popes, and, and they wielded incredible power over Western Europe. They carved the boundaries of many countries, and, and uh, the, the whole idea of the, 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 ex, the explorers that went out, the Spaniards and the Portuguese, because they were competing with each other, the pope basically said, okay, uh, Spaniards, you go, you head out west, the Portuguese, you head out east. And so that accounts for why Central America is Spanish speaking, South America is majority Spanish speaking, with the exception of Brazil. Uh, that had a lot to do with the papal decree that the Spanish explorers, you go west, the Portuguese, you go east. And so, you know, you've got, you got Portuguese colonies in Macau, China, Goa, India, uh, Angola in Africa, Mozambique, and so forth. And so the Roman Catholic Church, think of it as a snowball. It, it begins with this little, this little snowball that you make. And then if you keep rolling the snowball, obviously it's going to accrue. So by the time you get to the Middle Ages, uh, the early Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church has asserted that the tradition of the church is equal to scripture, and that only the the magisterium, that is the Pope and the bishops, they're the only rightful interpreters of scripture. So by the time you get to the Reformation, the reformers come on the scene and they say, whoa, um, where's original Christianity in, in this church? And so one of, the, one of the models of the Reformation was at Fontes, back to the fountains, back to the source. And so what the reformers did was they took this, think of it as an onion that you're peeling, that you can, so you can get to the core. They had to peel all this material that had accrued over centuries, like purgatory, um, uh, the, the idea of worshiping, or, or they say venerating the saints and praying the rosary, and, and the idea of, of um, uh, indulgences. All of these ideas had developed over the centuries. And this is openly admitted, even by Roman Catholic theologians and scholars, they'll openly admit this that this is something that accrued, that developed. And so what the reformers were saying was this, 
we don't want all this excess baggage. What we want is we want the source. We want to go back to primitive Christianity. And they believe that the only way you can do that is to go back to the scriptures, read the scriptures, and look at what the early church looked like. And we ought to live like that early church. So the Roman Catholic Church today, I mean, everything from priestly vestments to the bishops, to the popes, to the, to the nuns, and, and all of these accretions, um, you don't find any biblical justification for any of these things in the Bible. But the Roman Catholic Church will come back and say, yes, but that's because we don't believe in sola scriptura. We don't believe in scripture alone. We believe that there's three planks, scripture, the tradition of the church, and the magisterium that interprets the church. So the average Roman Catholic cannot understand the Bible by themselves. They cannot interpret the Bible for themselves because the Roman church claims it's, it's openly available. If you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church online, you can go to the Vatican, uh, Vatican website. You could read it for yourself. It clearly says that the right to interpret the scripture is not given to the laity but belong solely to Mother Church. It's only the Pope and the Magisterium that can rightly interpret the Bible for you. So that's why when I debate with Roman Catholics, they will always say, well, how did you know what books were in the Bible? How do you know that Matthew was canonical? You needed the church to tell you that. So at the end of the day, our Roman Catholic friends, even though they deny sola scriptura, they hold to sola ecclesia, that is church alone. At the end of the day, it's true because the church says it's true. And that is very dangerous because the church, as they call it, has contradicted itself through the popes and through the councils of the church throughout Christian history. And so if there's contradictions, this cannot be from God. And sola scriptura is the only, only scripture or text that the that that is called god breathed and so in second timothy 3 16 when paul says all scripture is god breathed the greek word is theanustos and that word theanustos only applies to scripture the fathers of the church never said their writings were equal to the scriptures or that their writings were god breathed never ever did they ever teach that but the roman church needs tradition to justify all of its additional doctrines and teachings that have no place in scripture. Uh, and again, um, if you read some serious Roman Catholic scholars, people like uh, Raymond Brown and, uh, and uh, Ludwig Ott and um, any serious scholar who is a Roman Catholic, if they're serious about the evidence, they'll openly admit everything I just told you is true, that these are accretions, developments that came later in the church. And that had to be pronounced as dogma by the Pope. You know, it's interesting uh, the way you talk about the Roman Catholic Church. It sounds a lot like the Mormons, uh, you know, with how they have multiple books being their authority. But also, you know, that with the caveat about the scripture, uh, I think it's said that uh, the Bible is reliable so long as it's translated or interpreted properly. Correct. And, uh, of course, any Protestant teaching will be you know, contrary to what they would consider interpreted properly. So, um, yeah, with a lot of these other religions, if, you know, it's almost like it's just automatically built into the system that you can't just get truth from the scripture, which is the fountain of truth, you know? Um, how do you think it is that the, like, uh, the magisterium obviously is kind of unique, but Specifically with traditions, why is it that traditions became the way they are? Is it just like you just said that they need it to justify where where they came from and where they are now, or is it is there a more complex answer than that? Well, I think I think a lot of it had to do with maintaining control and authority. You see, when the reformers came along and said, you know, we don't really need priests because we are all priests unto God. Uh, you know, the priesthood of all believers one of the things Luther taught on was the, priest, the priesthood of all believers. First Peter 2, 9, Revelation 1, 4 to 5, that you are a royal priesthood, you're a chosen people and so forth. And Christ has made his priest, a kingdom of priests to his God and father. Um, if we are priests and we can approach the throne of grace at any time, then why do we need a priest that is ordained by Rome to give you sacraments, which are 
means of grace. They're channels of grace. So if you want grace, you need the sacraments. But you see, now you're dependent on the church to give you the sacrament. So uh, if your child, uh, you don't want your child to go to hell or limbo, you, you bring your child to the church to be baptized, to receive grace so that their original sin is wiped clean. It's expunged. And, and even until death, from birth, from the womb to the tomb, even, even at the end of life, you call the priest to administer last rites and so forth. But what that does is if you are a priest unto God and you can approach the throne of grace at any time, why do I need Father McCoy to come and, and do this for me or do that for me? Now, again, the work of a pastor is, is not that of the pastor has this extraordinary authority or power uh, to do certain things that you can't do. The, the pastor, at least in the, in the evangelical tradition, is more of a leader, a facilitator, a teacher. But, but in the Roman Catholic Church, you need to understand that the, the priest is called uh, he is called Alter Christus, which in Latin means he is another Christ, because the priest has the authority by the power of his ordination that he can transubstantiate bread, that is, the bread into the body of Christ. And the official teaching is that he can call on Christ to come down from his throne and to enter into the elements of the bread and the wine. Now, here's the thing. Here's where this really gets interesting, is that that, that authority is irrevocable, which means that if a priest ever is defrocked, that if he's ever removed from his position as a priest, his authority to transubstantiate bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ cannot be revoked. Think about this for a minute. So, so a priest that has been kicked out still has the authority to transubstantiate because the belief in the Roman Catholic Church is that a sacrament, one of the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church is called holy orders, where the minister becomes a minister of the gospel by, by the act of the sacrament. And they believe that the mark that is, that is given through that sacrament is indelible. You can't get rid of it. And so one of the greatest fears that Roman Catholic clergy have is that some of these priests might try to use that authority, that power, in a satanic manner. And, and there are priests who, who have gone into Satanism, have gone into witchcraft. And, and, and the fear is they're going to use this to defile the body and blood of Christ. Um, and, and so now you can understand why the, Ref the Reformation was such a threat to the Roman Catholic Church, because it undermined its authority. It called into question the papacy, the power of indulgences, so if, if, if I have a Bible in my hand and I can read the word of God, why do I need the Roman Catholic Church to, to tell me, well, you need this and you need this mark of the cross on you and you need that sacrament and that sacrament. So as you can see, I think the real reason here is it was the Roman Catholic fear of loss of authority and power. Yeah, that's really helpful, Tony. Um, yeah, I was just, um, I was reading some common objections that Catholics have to Protestants just to try to get my head around some of this stuff. And I think one of the things that, uh, uh, talking about the, uh, the magisterium, I believe, um, uh, they try to, they try to use Isaiah 22, 15 through 16 as some kind of, <laughs> uh, I guess, some kind of platform for saying that that's how the papacy came about and, and things like that. What are your thoughts on on some of those, you know, kind of things that they may use to? Yeah, um, is, is that Isaiah? Uh, that's uh, the one about. Uh, I think I don't have. I don't I um, yeah, is it's uh, El Elkiem. Uh, uh, David. I think it's a. Is it Shebna? Um. Elkiem, the son of Helka. I can't say Hebrew names. Right. right. <laughs> uh, well, let me see if I have um, a Bible here that I could probably um, look at that. Let me see here. Um, well, yeah, uh, Ikla Kim, I think, is it went, uh, he's taking the place of the captain of the temple. Okay. The second in command to the high priest named Shebna. And uh, this 
uh, Catholic says that uh, we learn from Isaiah that he is the father figure to us all and that he will open and shut when it regards it. to faith. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And he has the keys and so forth and so yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, the quick response to that is what, what the Roman Catholics try to do is they try to use that as a, a justification for the papacy. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that it's not the papacy that's being foreshadowed there. It's actually Christ. Because in the book of Revelation, if you remember what Jesus said, is he says, he says that I am the root and the offspring of David. And he says that uh, I have the keys of, of uh, hell and death. And he says, I am he who opens and no one shuts, and he who shuts, no one opens. And so the one who bears the keys is not Peter. The one who bears the keys is the Messiah. And so in Isaiah 22, this is a, this is a foreshadowing, not of some galilean fishermen it's a it's a foreshadowing of the messiah a messianic figure uh peter of course was not the messiah so we know from the book revelation that the one who holds the keys is the lord jesus christ and 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 when jesus told peter in matthew 16 that um i give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven what you bind shall be bound and what you lose shall be loosed in in matthew 18 uh 20 he gives the same authority to all the apostles he says to them what you all so it's, it's, you know, I'm going to use a little bit of Southern accent here, but whatever you all bind will be bound and whatever you all uh, lose will be loosed. And so it's a second person plural there and he's applying it to all the apostles. So this isn't a special case with Peter. The reason why Peter is, 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 is the one who was first uh, called blessed and he gives him the keys is because Peter was the first to confess Jesus as the Messiah, the son of God. He was the first one to make the confession. And immediately after that, Jesus begins to focus on his, his passion, his death and resurrection. But the, the rest of the apostles received the same power. They also had the power to loose and to bind. And so Isaiah 22 is, they're robbing actually, the Roman church actually robs the Lord Jesus of his majesty and of his messianic status by taking that wonderful passage that is a, a, a foreshadowing of the Messiah on his throne, and they're giving it to Peter which is a terrible, this is exegesis here. That's not exegesis. That's exegesis. So if, if you follow the New Testament through, the only one who has the power to open and close is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. I'm right there with you, Tony. I was, because I, you know, reading a couple of the uh, objections they make to Protestantism in particular, um, I, I often wonder how Roman Catholics do biblical theology and if they even do it um, for one. And then just what, what is, do they, is their hermeneutics, I guess you could say the way they go about their interpretation all kind of based upon, like you mentioned, Sola Ecclesia, like the church is yes. the interpreter. So they don't, they don't really. Okay. Yeah. I was yeah, just curious how it, they did hermeneutics. It's all based on what the church says. Gotcha. And so you just saw an example there in Isaiah 22. It, 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 the reason why they think it refers to Peter is because the church says so. Uh, never mind context or never mind the, the messianic uh, uh, shadows, messianic types, proto, uh, the prototypes and so forth. Never mind all of that. Uh, we're going to get that passage uh, by George. We're going to get that passage to talk about Peter. It's going to refer to Peter. And they do this as well with the church fathers. They all make the church fathers into Roman Catholics. And, and the problem with that is that some of the church fathers disagreed with each other, and some of them were, were Eastern or Greek-speaking fathers. Uh, majority of them, the oldest ones, were Greek-speaking fathers. Later, it's not until you get to Tertullian, 200 AD, you get to the Latin fathers, and then, of course, Augustine and Ambrose and Jerome and so forth. You know, they're Latin speakers. But the fact of the matter is, you know, James White has always said, and I agree with him, that let's let the church fathers be the church fathers. You know, don't make them Reformed Baptists, don't make them Presbyterians, don't make them Orthodox, Roman Catholic, let them be who they are. They confessed faith in Christ, they trusted in Christ. Some of them were pretty weird in the sense of, they had some weird ideas, uh, like Jesus being 50 years old, uh, you know, Clement of Rome, uh, thinking that the, the story of the phoenix was true. He actually thought that the phoenix was a, was a true bird that uh that died in its in the flames uh, and then it was reborn as a new as a new bird and and he said that's a symbol of the resurrection well that's nice and all but clement didn't realize that the story of the phoenix was a myth it was just a pure myth uh, and and so we have examples of this you know 
Um, you've got, you know, the epistle of Barnabas, where he talks about the, that, that he talks about the weasel gives uh, birth through its mouth, which is a very strange idea. Uh, and then you've got others like, uh, like Irenaeus saying Jesus was 50 years old when he died. So the church fathers were fallible. They were not infallible. Um, they made mistakes. And, and you're to expect that because they were not inspired as the biblical writers were. And they spoke very highly of the scriptures. The, the fathers of the church saw the scriptures as the final Supreme Court in all matters. Um, and so when I teach on biblical reliability, we go through the church fathers. We go to, through uh, people like Clement and Ignatius and Irenaeus and, and, and Basil the Great. And we look at what these, these men have said and they all point to the scriptures. Athanasius said only in these, fountain, only in these scriptures do we have the only fount of life? Well, that sounds a lot like Sola Scriptura. Only in these do we have the fountain of life. Uh, and, and Augustine was willing to say that if we find a textual variant in the Bible, uh, it's not the scriptures that are in error. It's either the translator did, did not understand the text or the scribe confused one letter with another letter. But Augustine is very careful to say it's the scriptures that are ultimately infallible and inerrant. And they are the final arbiter in anything we decide. Uh, so our Roman Catholic friends, in order to back up this sacred tradition, they have to end up practicing uh, really uh, grammatical gymnastics. They really have to play with the text and, and, and tweak it and turn it so that they read into it a Roman Catholic interpretation. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, and I, I see that a lot. I, I mean, it almost seems every uh, most of the objections I hear to Protestant um, theology and and coming from the Reformation, specifically the five solas, uh, things like of that nature. It's always uh, people parrot kind of the same, <laughs> uh, you know, the only time it uses in the Bible, um, faith alone is when it's saying it's not by faith alone. And, you know, right. they always have or. Uh, yeah. They justify their tradition with uh, was uh, Second Thessalonians two fifteen, and and they yeah. try to use that, and and it's just so clear when you go to the context of these verses that it's yeah. just it's so off, you know. Yeah, and that's why I said it's esegesis. Yeah, because they're not reading out the text. When James says not by faith alone, they're ignoring the context. That that what James is getting at is that faith produces good works. Faith by itself, if it doesn't produce good works is dead, and therefore it's not genuine faith. That's what James means. Mm -hmm. And of course, James was at the council in Acts 15, where Peter said, we, we believe that it is by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we shall be saved, and that it's not by the works of the law. And so James was in full, total agreement with, 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 Paul, uh, with uh, Peter there, rather. Uh, and also, when they look at these other passages uh, in, in Scripture, like you said, in Thessalonians, you know, Paul says, you know, hold to the traditions that I gave to you. Well, notice it's in the past tense. He doesn't say, hold to the traditions will, which will continue in the church until Christ returns. He doesn't say that. He says it as something that has been delivered. It's, it's, it's past tense. And then later he says, uh, hold to the traditions, whether in word or writing, which means that what he taught them is what he wrote to them. In other words, what Paul preached to them was the gospel. And of course, he taught that orally to them when he planted the church. He was orally preaching the gospel to them, and then later he wrote to them. And so what he wrote and what he said agreed. So he wasn't saying, look, there's two planks of authority here, uh, two sources of authority. That is pure exegesis to read that into Paul's letter. Yeah, very good, very good. And and I, I guess, so what, what would be some of the main contrast between Roman Catholicism and, and Protestant theology? What would be the main contentions and or tensions and then maybe? Yeah, well, I think, I think it's what, what prompted the Reformation. I mean, the whole Reformation wasn't a debate about the Trinity. The Reformation wasn't a debate about uh, the deity of Christ. All those things were agreed upon. But if you remember, what Luther said was the whole church stands or falls on one issue, and that is the issue of justification by faith alone. And he said that that is the hinge upon which the door moves, upon which the church moves, is this doctrine. And I think Luther was right, because 
while Roman Catholics today will affirm all of these fundamental doctrines of God, you know, the Trinity, the virgin birth, Christ's resurrection, uh, all of these things are affirmed by Rome and affirmed by Protestants and or the Orthodox Church as well. And this is where you get this idea of mere Christianity. You may remember C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Mere Christianity. And basically, mere Christianity is, is if you will, this, it's Christianity with all of its creeds that can be agreed upon, this common denominator. And so today, you'll notice there are some evangelical leaders today who will not uh, uh, think that, that they think Roman Catholics are in the same boat with evangelicals, that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So, you know, Frank Turek would use that type of argument. He thinks that Roman Catholics can also be true brothers and sisters in Christ. And the late Ravi Zacharias as well said the same thing. Uh, and where Reformed Christians differ on this is that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians, uh, in that letter that he says he wrote with his own hand, because it was such an urgent matter, he refers to what he calls the truth of the gospel twice in that letter the truth of the gospel. And then he says in Galatians 1 that there are some who are disturbing them and that are seeking to pervert the gospel of Christ. They're trying to distort it. And then Paul says this, that if anyone comes to you and preaches to you another gospel other than the gospel you received, let him be anathema. And then he says, even if an angel appears to you, uh, and then he repeats it again, I say again, if anyone comes to you. So he's really emphasizing something here. And he starts his letter off by addressing this. Now, who was he talking about? We all know Paul was talking about the Judaizers. Now, the Judaizers didn't deny the deity of Christ, because notice Paul never said the Judaizers denied the deity of Christ. He never said that. In fact, they agreed that Christ was truly the God-man. They believed in the resurrection. That was not in dispute. What was in dispute then? What was in dispute was the truth of the gospel. What were the Judaizers saying? The gospel is God's grace plus the law, circumcision, the law of Moses, keeping the feast days, the Jewish law, and so forth. Paul says, if the gospel is not sufficient in itself to save us, and if you add anything to the gospel, it is no longer the gospel of grace. And so anyone who says we're saved by faith, and then plus whatever it is, the sacraments or your, your good deeds or anything like that, that is not the gospel of grace. Now, you need to understand something. The word anathema that Paul uses there is a word that means to be under the divine curse of God. And Paul is bringing down this divine curse on those who, even though they believe in all these fundamental areas, they deny the gospel of grace alone. Now, that's very serious because the dividing line here is the gospel. And that's what the reformers were debating. If you remember, it was the gospel. The, the, how is a man, how is a sinner made right with God? Is it by grace in the finished work of Christ, or is it faith in Christ plus the sacraments, devotion to Mary, devotion to the saints, uh, purgatory to pay for temporal sins, temporal punishments, and so forth? And so this is, this is really the dividing line here. So, so when it comes to our Roman Catholic friends, they don't believe in sola fide. What I mean by that is, if you were to ask a Roman Catholic, do you believe we're saved by God's grace? Of course we're saved by God's grace. But that's not the question. The question is not the, the efficiency of grace. We both agree that grace is necessary for salvation. The question is the sufficiency of grace. Is grace sufficient to save us? And the gospel message that the apostles gave us was, yes, faith in Christ. We are justified by faith through what? Through faith in Christ. We have peace with God, and therefore God uh, imputes the righteousness of Christ to our account. Rome doesn't believe you're saved by faith alone. They will tell you that. It's not just faith alone that saves. You need to do good works to maintain that faith. So my beef with the Roman church and the Orthodox church is they deny not just sola scriptura, they deny sola gratia, grace alone, and sola fide. And therefore, how you can say that this is the same gospel that the apostles preached, and yet Paul brings down, the, using the strongest word in the Greek New Testament, 
brings down the curse of God on anyone who would teach another gospel that would include uh, good works and the law and, 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 and so forth. Paul says you have, you have fallen from grace in Galatians 5. He actually says those of you who seek to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. That's a pretty serious uh, a charge there. And he says, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. In other words, the moment you believe that you need to add to what Christ has done, then you have already said Christ's sacrifice was insufficient to save you. So that's where, that's the dividing line right there with our Roman Catholic friends. It's not the fundamentals. We can all agree on those. But where we differ is how a man is made right with God. Oh, well, Tony, let me... Let me stop you right there. You know, the works of the law, that's the ceremonial law. That has nothing to do with the moral law, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, this is the thing. The law is the, the, the thing about the, the, the Mosaic law. And this is an area where, where some of our Reformed brethren, unfortunately, following Calvin, have fallen into this trap. Uh, and then Calvin got it from Thomas Aquinas. And, and that's the view that the law is uh, we're under the moral law. We're still under the moral law. And the moral law is the Ten Commandments and all these moral uh, injunctions in the, in the Old Testament. And that Christ only abolished the ceremonial law and the judicial law and so forth and so on. No first century writer or no first century Jew would know what you're even talking about. If you were to come to Paul and say, hey, Paul, yeah, you're, what you're saying is that's the ceremonial law. You're not talking about the moral law. And what we need to understand is that the law, the law, the Torah, the law that God gave Moses was a unit, it was a package deal. There were no laws, plural. It's not like when I'm talking about the law of Moses, I meant those ceremonial laws. I don't mean all those moral laws. No, the law is a unit. And that's why Paul said, if you be circumcised, you are a debtor to the whole law, not to part of it, but to all of it. 613 commandments in the law of Moses. And so the New Testament is very clear that in the New Testament, you have something called the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2, and um, in Galatians 6, 2, the, the, the law of the spirit of life is also called the law of Christ. Uh, the law of Christ is what Christ has given to us in the New Covenant, which includes many of the moral uh, commandments in the Old Testament and prohibitions. So, for example, nine of the Ten Commandments are reaffirmed in the new covenant, the Sabbath commandment is not. And that's the reason for that is the Sabbath commandment was connected to the Mosaic covenant that has ended with Christ. And so when our, our Roman Catholic friends say, but that's the ceremonial law, but, but that's not the way Paul looked at it. Paul is saying, if you add anything to what Christ has done, whether it's, hey, you know what? I, I don't steal, I don't blaspheme, I don't worship other gods and so forth. Well, we know that none of us can keep the law. I mean, it's very clear. The scripture says that the law was given to reveal sin and to shut everybody's mouth so that we would be, we would, we would be at the end of our rope and say, okay, I'm lost. I need someone. I need a perfect redeemer, somebody who can take my place. Uh, and so um, when our Roman Catholic friends play that game, uh, it's very clear that what they're doing is they're they're mincing the, 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 the idea of God's law into parts where the scriptures never give sanction for that. Uh, so that idea comes from Aquinas. 300 years later, Calvin borrowed that idea from Aquinas. And so today you will notice in, in, in many of our reform circles, uh, a lot of reform folks will say things like, well, you know, the moral law still stands, but the, the ceremonial laws have been abolished. Well, no, the, the law was, again, it's a package deal. You can't just pick and choose any, mini, miny, mo. I'll take this one. I won't take that one. And all of it was fulfilled in Christ. Every single bit of it, all of it, even the moral commands were fulfilled because Christ had to keep the law perfectly. He had to keep it for us so that, so that God could take his righteousness and impute it to us, not just his perfect death, but his perfect life. And so the atonement wasn't just Christ died on the cross. It includes his perfect life that he lived on our behalf. Uh, and so that's why it's so important to understand that, unfortunately, our Roman Catholic friends uh, are not trusting in Christ alone. They're trusting in Christ, and they're trusting in Mary, 
and they're asking Mary to intercede for them. They're, they're praying to the saints, and they're trusting that the church will pray for them after they've died and gone to purgatory. The church will pray for them so that their souls may be cleansed and they would be admitted into heaven. Very helpful. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. Um, so I guess um, I was thinking the, the uh, so I'm sure there's lots of takes on the whole purgatory thing and, and well, not lots of takes, obviously for the Catholics is they would say is consistent with what they've always thought about it, but particularly what, what, where, where would that, where'd that come from? You know, I, I know I hear stories of the guys that would try to sell the, um, indulgences and whatnot i think that was during the time of luther am i correct yes, yes. yeah maybe you could talk a little bit about you know the doctrine of pure uh, the purgatory a little bit yeah. well the doctor the, the the idea of purgatory also developed in in the church it, it wasn't something that again it's not found in the new testament roman catholics will always play esegesis with that but it's it's clear from the new testament and the old testament that Ultimately, after death, there, there's only two destinations, right? I, I refer to it as the smoking section and the non-smoking section. You know, Jesus talked about the sheep going into eternal life and the goats going into eternal damnation. There is no third place. There's no alternative. There's no middle place between heaven and hell. Uh, the idea evolved within church history that some people, um, while they may have done good works and, and and lived a good life what happens if somebody dies with unconfessed sin so so god forbid uh nathan that you know you go out for a pizza tonight or something god forbid that something happens to you and let's say uh on the way there you thought of somebody that really offended you and 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 you had this fit of momentary anger where you wished him you know wished him dead or, you know, you probably, <coughs> excuse me, had some lewd thought in your mind, which is sinful. Well, what happens? Let's say you die. Um, what happens to that unconfessed sin? Well, the Roman Catholic Church says, well, God cannot allow sin into heaven. Whole, heaven is holiness. It's a place of holiness and purity. And therefore, if you die uh, with unconfessed sin, then you've got you gotta, to you gotta clean that up. Like you, you can't, you can't go to uh, a wedding if you if your clothes are all dirty and tattered, you got to get cleaned up, right? Or if someone invites you to dinner, you know, and you've been working in the in the in the backyard and you've got dirt on your knees and your hands, obviously, is very unbecoming to go visit someone with dirt on you. So the idea is, well, you got to clean yourself up, you got to purge yourself, and so the idea is that you go into this place this place of temporary purgation, purgatory, purging. And then after you're cleaned up, you can go to your desired destination. And the idea evolved within church history that, that it, it, you got to make up for this, this unconfessed sin. Now, this is why the doctrine of justification is so important. Because the doctrine of justification says that your standing is in Christ. And that from God's perspective, he has declared us just. He has declared us not guilty. And therefore, the reason why God can let you into heaven is because not only has Christ paid the debt, but Christ has clothed you with his righteousness. In the Roman Catholic view, the idea is Christ has not yet, you have not yet been fully justified. So what they do is they place, they place justification at the end. So they'll say, you receive a measure of it at baptism, but then you, you lose it, and then you got to go to confession, do penance, and so you're going through sanctification. And the only time God will let you into heaven is, is at the very end, where you're when you're completely cleaned, God can say, okay, Nathan, now I justify you. The, the Protestant view says, no, justification comes first. It is a forensic act. It's finished. It's done. And then we go through sanctification, and then glorification is the final the final stage. So that is where the idea of purgatory came from. Now, if you ask a Roman Catholic, where's purgatory in the Bible? They'll go, it's in 2 Maccabees. It's in the book of 2 Maccabees, uh, at chapter 14. And there it talks about uh, Judas Maccabees 
uh, his armies, some of them fell in battle and Judas took uh, uh, the, the war booty and, and he paid for sacrifices to be made and prayers for, for the dead. But the problem is, this is why they needed Second Maccabees in the canon. They needed that book to back up purgatory, even though it was not accepted by the Jews or by Jerome, he, because he knew his Hebrew Bible. Um, and even in that story, Nathan, if you read that story in Second Maccabees 14, uh, those who fell in battle, it tells us the reason why they fell in battle was because God had punished them because they found on their bodies these necklaces of these amulets to a pagan god. So these were apostate Jews. <laughs> and according to Roman Catholic doctrine, idolatry is one of the cardinal sins. It's a mortal sin that sends you straight to hell. So these guys had no hope at all because they committed a mortal sin, which means according to Roman Catholic doctrine, they would go to hell. And therefore, it was pointless to even pray for them. Uh, and even today in modern day Judaism, Jews don't pray for the dead. What they do is they say Kaddish. It's it's. And Kaddish has to do with giving glory to God and affirming belief in the resurrection and so forth. But this idea of praying for the dead, this is something that comes out of paganism. And, uh, and so it's very foreign to the scriptures. And if you and I believe what Hebrews 1.3 says, that after Christ had purged our sins in his own blood, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. If we believe that, then Jesus Christ is our purgatory. He purged our sins in his own blood, a perfect redemption. But in the Roman Catholic system, salvation is not perfect. That's why you got to keep going back to Mass. You got to confess. You got to take the Eucharist. You got to go back. It's over and over and over. And, and so, what does Hebrews say? Well, if you have to keep offering up the same sacrifice, it's a sacrifice that cannot take away sin. That's why Christ had to come. By one sacrifice, he has forever sanctified the people of God in himself. He's a perfect Savior. And when he said it is finished on the cross of Calvary, he meant it. It was finished once for all. Amen. Um, Tony, I, I had a question for you. Um, how long do we have you for? About another 10 minutes or a little bit longer? Yeah, than that? about another 10 minutes or so. Yeah. So what would you uh, say to the Christian who has a Catholic friend. I know we covered quite a bit of ground here, but what would you say the best entry point is to a conversation uh, with somebody who's Catholic and reasonably knows what the Catholic faith teaches, um, you know, because there are a lot of obstacles to overcome with yeah. uh, the tradition books and the magisterium, sure. you know, and all these things. What, what would you say the best entry point is to have a conversation and to challenge them on? Yeah, I would focus on, on the finished work of Christ, and I would focus on, uh, you know, the, 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 the very common question we always hear uh, from, the, from the preachers, uh, that if you were to die today, would you be in heaven, or would you be in purgatory, or, or would you be in hell? And what I do is I focus on the perfect finished work of Christ, uh, and Hebrews is a great place to go to, to study with them, particularly Hebrews uh, 7, 8, uh, 9, and 10. Uh, and so what I do is I challenge my Roman Catholic friends, do you trust Christ alone for your salvation? And, and can you tell me with a straight face that if you were to die today, you would be immediately in the presence of Christ? Uh, if they cannot answer that question, most of them would say, uh, well, I've got sin that I have to deal with, and uh, I'll probably be in purgatory and so forth. Um, then what that tells me is that the work of Christ is not perfect for them. And so what I focus on is the perfection of Christ's sacrifice, that once for all sacrifice that Christ uh, offered up in his own body. Uh, and so I think that by focusing on the gospel of grace and faith in Christ as the only savior of mankind, I think that is the best place to go. And then once that's been established, then we can talk about the papacy and, and, and the whole Marian dogmas and, and, and all the other tertiary areas that Roman Catholicism holds to, but I would focus on the uniqueness and the perfection of Christ's atonement. And that's got to be such a blessing for, for a devout Catholic to come for, out of Catholicism into something where you're not workspaced, where you don't have to go continually to a priest to confess. You can go right to God yourself because Jesus Christ is our mediator. And, and like you said, we are priests in his kingdom. And, um, 
yeah, it's, it's just incredible when I think of, you know, people coming out of these, you know, uh, different religions, um, you know, Roman Catholicism, Jeho- being uh, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, they're, they're all works based and the kind of anxiety those people have to live under day yeah. by day is just, uh, it's got to be mind numbing. So. Yeah, yeah, it is. And that's why indulgences, if you ever wonder why St. Peter's Basilica uh, looks so uh, elaborate and, and so majestic, that, 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 that basilica was built on the backs of the poor of Europe. And the poor of Europe, who were illiterate, majority of them were illiterate, uneducated, these folks were being told that their loved ones were suffering and being tormented in purgatory. And if they would uh, uh, give a do- uh, uh, if they would give a donation, uh, the Pope would grant them an indulgence, where it would lessen the time of their loved ones in purgatory. It's like a a judge saying to a criminal, "Well, due to your good behavior, we're going to cut off some of your prison time." Um, and how would they do that? Well, they would do that by buying indulgences. And there was a saying that Johannes Tetzel, as he was going through Germany, Johannes Tetzel said, "The moment that the Uh, The moment that the coin in the coffer rings, a soul springs out of purgatory. And so a lot of these poor folks were just paying all this money. Uh, And and again, the whole idea that you can buy the grace of God. Remember what Peter told Simon Magus about giving money to to, so he can have the Holy Spirit. And and Peter basically says, you and your money can perish with you. and so when I look, when, when my wife and I visited Rome and we, we went to the Vatican and I saw there the Basilica of St. Peter's and we actually, I don't know how we did it, but we got into, we got into the Vatican. We ended up in the crypts, which is pretty spooky <laughs> under, the, under the Vatican. But um, uh, when I looked at that and I thought, you know, when you, when you go inside in the main altar there, the bronze altar and, and over the rotunda there, you've got written in. In, in gold lettering, you've got that statement from Matthew 16 that you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. And I just look at that and I think, wow, you know, the, 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 the poor, uh, you know, the poor were, were fleeced uh, so they can take money to build this. Uh, and it's very sad when you really think about it. And, uh, and you know, the, the Reformation came and said, post tenebrous looks after darkness light. And when the light of God's word came, when people like uh, Wycliffe and Tyndale and Hus in, in uh, Czechoslovakia and, and others came and took the Bible and said the people have the right to read the word of God in their own language. You know, Luther did that with Germany too. He took, he took Erasmus's Greek New Testament, he translated it into German. Uh, and, and amazing, you know, whenever God's word is, is dispelled throughout the people, there's this influx of light. And um, and, and when you really think about it, folks, when you really think about it, uh, the, found, the founding of the United States would not, would not have been possible without the Reformation. Because when the Puritans came to the United States, these Puritans were Protestants. And these Puritans based everything they believed on, on the Reformation doctrines. And what made America great was the Puritan influence in the country that influenced people like Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and others. And it was from the Puritans, they got this idea that all men are created equal and that they're given inalienable rights by their creator, by God himself. And so the whole American revolution, the whole making of America was part and parcel related to the reformation. If there was no reformation, I doubt, well, see, if there was no Reformation, there would be no Puritans to be persecuted in England, and there would be no conformists, no John Bunyan, and you know what I'm saying? So the whole Mayflower, the whole travel of the pilgrims across the Atlantic to the American shores was, was because of their Reformation convictions. Um, well, Tony, oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead, I'm done. I was just going to say, I, I agree with you. To make America great again, we we need more Puritans. We need a resurgence of Puritan theology Absolutely. and personal piety. And yeah, I mean, uh, I've never heard it put that way, but I, yeah, we need uh, we need Christians to be Christians. Amen. Exactly. But, yeah. Thank you for entertaining my questions. I'll hand you over to Nate for the last two minutes here. So. Fair. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, no, it's good. Uh, yeah. Um, so Tony, in, in closing, I know one particular thing that comes up in a lot of these conversations is what do we make of 
um, people in the Roman Catholic Church, maybe particularly people that may be ignorant of what they got themselves into, or maybe are just uh, possibly believe in the gospel of grace, but they just don't quite understand that. And if that makes sense, like, yeah. do we do we consider these people brothers and sisters, or are they, you know, not? Um, I know it's a difficult question to navigate. You got to be careful, but okay. yeah, yeah, it's a very it's it's a legitimate question. Um, I have no doubt there are people in the Roman Catholic Church and in the Orthodox Church that are trusting Christ alone. But my experience shows me that you cannot stay in that state. The, the status quo cannot remain. Because eventually, when I became a believer, I was uh, because I was a young believer, I was still going to the Roman Catholic Church, and I realized I couldn't stay there because what they were saying and confessing in their liturgy was conflicting with Scripture and my conscience. And so remember what Luther said, unless I'm convinced by Scripture and by conscience, those are the two main things, right? To go against your conscience, he says, is not safe, nor right. And, and so what I find is that people who find Christ in the Roman Catholic Church, there are, and all the reformers, remember, all the reformers, Luther was saved while he was still a Roman Catholic priest. And so was Calvin. He was still in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Knox was still in the Roman Catholic uh, Church. Um, Huss was still in the Roman Catholic Church. Wycliffe was, a, was still in the Roman Catholic Church. Each one of these were saved in the Roman Catholic Church, not, by, not because of the Roman Catholic Church, but by the gospel. And so what Luther wanted at first, Luther wasn't thinking of, I'm going to, I'm going to start a denomination called the Lutheran Church. He, that was the, the, the most distant thing from his mind. He wasn't looking to split with the church. He was looking to reform the church. He wanted the church to reform, and the church refused to reform. And so what did they do? They expelled him. They, they literally excommunicated him and condemned him as a heretic. And so he said, okay, fine. If that's, you know, and then he, he burns the papal bull that actually condemned him. Uh, but then he goes forward and says, I'm going to start a Bible believing church. And, and then later Calvin would say the Roman church doesn't have the signs of a true church anyway. So what I would say is this, um, there are people in the Roman church that are trusting Christ alone. We need to pray for them. We need to love them. And if the Holy Spirit is in them, he will convict their hearts about uh, all of these issues that, that of course go against uh biblical uh, Christianity. Um, so the last thing you want to do is just say, oh, don't worry about it. Just stay in there. Again, remember what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and following. He says, do not be unweakly yoked with unbelievers. What accord does light have with darkness? What, what agreement does Christ have with Belial, the devil? Uh, you cannot have agreement between the temple of God and the temple of idols. There has to be a separation. You know, come out from among them, says the Lord, be separate. And then you'll be my sons and daughters and so forth. So what I'm saying is this. There are Roman Catholics that are very novel in their faith in Christ, uh, trusting Christ alone. They don't believe they're going to be saved by works. The question is, you need to join with a Bible-believing church that, that holds to Christ's lordship, supremacy of his word, and so forth. Um, and that's not to be unloving at all. Now, don't forget, many Roman Catholic apologists today are just as zealous to get you into the Roman Catholic Church. They're inviting Protestants into the Roman Catholic Church. And you'll always hear about these famous people, you know, like that, uh, like I think it was Frank Beckwith, and, and you'll hear about uh, a whole bunch of grads from Southern Evangelical Seminary, Norman Geisler Seminary, that had, had crossed or, or swam the Tiber. But that only happens when you don't deal with the gospel of grace. See, this is the problem. I mean, even with our Arminian friends, our Arminian friends uh, are very close in their theology to, to Roman Catholicism than they are to Reformed theology. Because the Arminian gospel says, well, you know, you, you have to choose Christ. It's up to you. You have to invite Christ in. You could lose your salvation. And that's the same thing Rome teaches. Exactly. It's your free will. You, you could lose your salvation. You can go to hell even though you, you've been justified. Uh, and that is why when Jacobus Arminius started teaching this, the, the, reforms, the reformers in, 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 in Holland at the Synod of Dort said, you're just teaching, this is simply Roman Catholicism without the Pope. It's the same idea, the same idea you're propounding. Uh, and, and so this is why 
there's a reason why we're called reformed. And that is because we're not just going back to the reformation. We're holding on to those doctrines of grace. Uh, and that those doctrines of grace bring out the majesty of God and it seeks God's glory alone and not ours. It's God alone and sola Deo gloria to the glory of God alone. Amen. Amen. That's, that's a great uh, place to stop, Tony. I know you have, um, I believe you, who do you have? Uh, you have, I, I'm, I have uh, Dr. Michael Brown is joining me tonight on my YouTube channel to, we're going to be discussing uh, uh, Jewish objections to Jesus being the Messiah. Awesome. Yeah. That's I can't believe I can't believe we're having a conversation with you, Tony, right before you're having a conversation with with him. I mean, it's just such a disparagingly different kind of a just a couple of lay guys and then yeah, uh, and then him. So I've, I've listened to him for years. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys are welcome to join tonight. I think I sent you the link, Nathan. So uh, oh. it'll, it'll be live streamed on YouTube tonight at 730. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. you Tony. To join. Yeah, you guys are welcome to join. Yeah, well, man, Tony, this has been phenomenal. We're so grateful for you, brother, and you. all that you're doing for the Lord. Uh, you know, we we're just so grateful for you, man. You're, you're hey, so I, I'm grateful to have you guys too, and then you know, you guys are my brothers. I love you guys, and uh, we're we're just we're just workers in the vineyard of the Lord, and so we're here to advance the gospel, and it's for His glory. This isn't for our glory. This isn't for our recognition. Um, you know, Richard Baxter, that famous Puritan once said, we're just beggars showing other people where to find bread. Mm -hmm. And so we're pointing them to the bread of life. Amen. 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 Well, Tony, this has been phenomenal. Thank you so much for doing this, brother. Um, definitely got to have you back again and, and, you know, bless our listeners with you. you. You're just a phenomenal teacher. You're so helpful for us and understanding a lot of these things that other words, or I mean, would be a lot harder for us to understand. And we're just so grateful for all your well, teaching and help helpful stuff my pleasure my pleasure mm. all right so this is uh rooted in revelation oh real quick tony uh if people are interested in your books and and some of your work where can they find it yeah uh well my book uh early christian creeds and him uh it is it is on amazon uh but if you go to uh, what i'll do if i uh, are you posting this on your link um yeah please? we can put it in the description if you want yeah okay uh what i can do is uh if you if you just look at uh, if you just put if you do a search I mean if you want I can just send you can try send you the link now if you want sure is that, yeah is that, is that okay yeah, yeah that's we'll, fine. Put, we'll put the link up in the description yeah, yeah. now uh, are, are there people joining you live or is this to be is this going this up is uh, recorded right now okay. yeah okay so what I should do a live one though that'd be fun yeah that'd yeah be true yeah. I don't even know how to do that yet. <laughs> so, so let me just uh, bring that up and, uh, and I'm going to send you, I'll send it to you in the chat. All right. I'll, I'll give you the publisher. The publisher is much more, Amazon always charges more for some reason. And the, the publisher right now is offering it, uh, is offering it for $13 Canadian, which I think for you guys is probably going to be 11 bucks American. Um, so let me just get that here for you. Uh, just want to copy it here. Okay. All right. Uh, control C. Okay. All right. So I'm going to put it in the chat here. Uh, let me see. Hopefully you guys, here it is the chat and, um, let's see. Uh, Okay, I'm using my wife's uh, Mac here. So um, yeah, just give me a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah, I'm a PC guy, but I'm using her Mac. Um, okay, I think it's Command C. That's what it is, Command C. Mm. Okay, Alrighty, here we go. Let's see if I can get this in here. I think I've, uh, here we go. All right, so there's the link. Uh, Great. Hesed uh, and uh, Hesed and Emmet.com. So they're the publishers, and it's it, the price is much more affordable there than you'd find it on uh, Amazon. Gotcha. Yeah, I will definitely add that in the link. And um, yeah, so listeners, make sure you definitely go pick up his work. 
Um, and, and we have an earlier episode with Tony Costa as well on early Christian creeds and hymns. Go listen to that as well. And Tony, where can people find you and kind of see where you're at and what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. Well, what what they can do uh, is they can find me on uh, YouTube and I'm going to send that to you as well, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I should have done that before. I think I uh, I think I know I ha- I'm subscribed to it, so I can always get a link. Um, oh, okay. and I'll, I'll put it in the description as well. So, okay. okay. That's great. That's great. So, um, just in case you don't have it, I'm just going to just send it to you, uh, right now. So that's right. one of the best ways they can get, get me is on, is on YouTube and, uh, uh, yeah. And, and Facebook as well. Um, great. I think you're on my Facebook. Yeah. You're on yeah. Messenger with me, so. Yeah, and I, I always talk with you, so we're like yeah. best friends. So that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tony, thank you so much, thank and you. yeah, and listeners, till next time. Uh, I'm sure Tony Casa would be more willing to come teach us some more stuff uh, another time. And uh, until next time, this is Rudin Revelation Podcast. God bless.